You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Good evening and good afternoon. Depends when they are they, what I, I think it's an afternoon show right now. Uh, good afternoon, Humble Faith listeners. This is Sean Kelly, your host of Humble Faith, where normal people can express their fears, doubts, concerns, and questions about God and faith and religion. As you know, we always bring an amazing believer onto our show, and today's show is no different. We've got Jim Crockett, and I met Jim through a really good friend of mine, uh, a young lady named B. Mozanin, who is a native to Nashville, Tennessee. She's a coaching client of mine, and her B and I, B is one of my most most dedicated prayer warriors. I have no doubt her prayers helped me get through my near-death experience with COVID, and right now B is going to bat for, actually, she's her and I have been praying for my brother to find God, and B made this introduction to Jim Crockett. Uh, Jim, uh, tell us a little about, uh, first off, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking Thank you. time to join us today. No, it's my honor to, to be interviewing you today. Jim is has a PhD in theology, and he is a true believer and absolutely loves the Word of God and the teachings of the Word, so we're going to explore that together, and of course, we'll be bringing you know, our, those fears, doubts, concerns, and questions uh, to Jim throughout our conversation. So Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about your faith-based background? How did you become such an avid believer? And when did you realize like it was your calling to you know, go to ten, for 10 years of schooling for this? Yeah, so I, I was, I, I'd say I was blessed to be raised in a home with both parents as, as believers and um, went to church pretty much all my life. Um, well, raised in a Presbyterian church in Nashville, Tennessee, through my senior in high school, and then started going to a Baptist church after that. And and I've never looked so much at the name on the outside of the door. My father taught me it's not so much the name on the door, but what do they teach on the inside? And so I was blessed to be able to 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 be taught the Bible, uh, to learn the Bible. I actually went to a Christian day school my ninth through twelfth grade years um, in, in the Nashville area, and. My goal out of high school was to be a doctor, and I had a I had a pretty good motivation for it. I'm one of six boys, and and my, my the third of the four brothers, uh, the first four of us were born in less than four years. My dad told my mother on the second day, God is going to give me six boys, and sure enough, six boys, and uh, she was the 14th of 16, so she, and had six brothers herself, so it didn't scare her as far as that goes. She's pretty excited about it, but. I always prayed she might have a girl. She had four miscarriages, whether they were the girls or not, I don't know. But anyway, so um, I, I wanted to be a doctor. You know, my, my brother died of leukemia, and uh, it was in the early days of the bone marrow transplant. 1973 was when he passed away. And I thought, you know, I'll do something with my life, maybe be a pediatrician or maybe do some research and that sort of thing. When I graduated from high school, I really kind of began to consider my life and while I would The way I would describe myself, I was religious in the sense that I knew about church. I knew about God. I knew who Jesus was. Uh, I believed in in who he was. Um, I I never doubted the, the, you know, the claims of the scripture regarding Jesus as the son of God and, and even his resurrection and the victory, you know, which is the victory over sin and death. And, and, um, but I began to kind of think about my own life personally and that I really have a personal relationship and, the way I would describe my condition at that point in time, I was religious, but I was not righteous. And by that, I mean, I, I was doing a lot of things, but I never really entered into a personal relationship with Jesus and had my sin forgiven and his righteousness given to me in place of my sin. So um, uh, really in between my senior in high school and freshman year at Vanderbilt, I, I got accepted to Vanderbilt University in the pre-med program I decided I was going to go to Bible college for a year and study the scripture so I could get grounded in my faith. And it was during that first year there in Bible college that I really realized that, that just that I I was, I was, I was living, I was living religiously, but I never really entered into a relationship with Jesus. And I'll never forget. It was a Sunday morning. Uh, The church I was attending at the time had an eight day revival crusade. Don't, You don't have many of those anymore, but there was a preacher that came from New England down to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and from a Sunday to a Sunday, he preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, and every night. And on Saturday night, he announced that on Sunday morning, he was going to preach from the Gospel of John, you must be born again. 
And I told the Lord that night, if Lord, I, I'm tired of struggling with this whole thing, not knowing, am I really in the right relationship with you? I'm going to listen and I'm going to let you convict me about what's going on in my heart. You speak to me. And at the end of that service on that Sunday morning, I knew exactly what I needed to do. And so in, in that particular church service at the end, they would give an invitation. They would invite people to come to respond. And I did and went down and met a man by the name of Ab Thomas. And Ab sat down with me. I shared my story with him. And he led me to understand that it's really not about all the good things that you do. The scripture says it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, that we're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that morning, I repented of my sin and received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And and I know, and, and knowing in a greater way now, after studying the scripture and going through all the degree program that... Um, that uh, what Jesus did that day was as I became a child of God, forgave me my sin. And from that point forward, uh, it, you know, my passion and my desire to be able to share that message with people so they can know that um, uh, at that point in time, I, I was raised in the, in Tennessee in the South, Nashville, the buckle of the Bible belt, they call it. Uh, you know, I felt like there was a lot of people like me. And so what can I do to share the gospel of people who they weren't on the atheistic or agnostic, uh, that side of the of the of the unbelief, but maybe in some ways even worse because they they thought maybe that their religion had put them in a good place place like I thought, but never really never really um, had that personal relationship. And as time goes on, and if you don't have that relation relationship out, you can't live out what you don't have. And so um, later on, I would find that God would speak to my heart through Psalm seventy three twenty eight that He was calling me into ministry. Um, and that was during my second year of college. And I've never doubted that from that point to this. I, I graduated in 1985. I went to work in churches from 1985 all the way to the end of 2014. Along the way, I got a master's degree and then finished my, my PhD. Actually, after, after um, I, I resigned from the church, I pastored for 17 and a half years. And then the last 10 years, we've been doing mission work. And my, my desire through the course of that time is to grow in my understanding of the faith or what does the Bible teach? I pursued the master's and the PhD, not so much for the degrees, but I wanted to know the Bible. I wanted to understand what it had to say, the truths and the teachings that are there. And um, in particular, I really, I love the old Testament. It's, it's certainly an interesting part of the Bible, but I really enjoy the new Testament and especially the new Testament epistles as it relates to the church. So yeah, that's uh that's kind of a small snippet of my faith journey, and I'm thankful. I, I would close it with this. I, uh, when someone asked me, how do you know you're in that right relationship? How do you know that heaven's your eternal home, that, that Jesus is your Savior? The Bible says that as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Uh, my father used to say to me, son, you don't accept Jesus, you receive Jesus. And what he meant by that, if, if you accept something, you accept something because it meets a certain set of conditions that you establish in order for it to be acceptable. He said, but what we do is, is we receive Jesus. We take Jesus as he gives himself to us, you might say. And then what he does is, is he makes you accepted in the beloved. So that's really the beauty of the picture of grace is that, that I cannot change myself. I cannot undo my sin. I cannot create enough righteousness to overcome my sin. But what God does through the, through the sacrifice of Jesus is he makes me, the scripture says, accepted in Christ or accepted in the beloved. So I am fit. Uh, Colossians says, I am now qualified to be a partaker of his inheritance. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I, I thank God for that. Yeah, you know, that's, I love that you brought that up. It's interesting because like within the last two weeks, I was uh, chatting with someone about that uh, similar topic and they, you know, they, I, they were, what are they, we were talking about how, like, why Christianity and it, because it's like the only religion where you don't need to like succeed based on merit. I mean, yes, we, we, we are, we have to be as righteous as possible. Right. And, and, uh, and I want to talk more about this, but, uh, but it, it was interesting because he was saying that. Uh, what was he he's saying? Like we're the only religion where, like Jesus has already sacrificed Himself for our sins, so like yeah. we're already forgiven. And, and I, I thought that was pretty powerful. 
Whereas, you know, any other religion, it's like you have to you have to earn it, so to speak. Not to say yeah. we still have to do our best, right? Um, yeah. So that's a tough but one. The, to the, the writer of Hebrews says it like this, that Jesus has offered himself as one sacrifice for sin and has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And he's now sat down at the right hand of the Father. The reality is, according to the teaching of the scriptures, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is not enough the first sacrifice to cleanse us from our sin, then then nothing will ever be enough. But because it because he is enough, the, the, the precious blood of Christ, and that's something people don't always like to talk about. But but it, it's through the through the death, but through the shedding of the blood of Christ that that atonement for sin was made through His blood that He has perfected or He has completed me um, and given me that righteousness, and which enables me now to live out that righteousness not in order to gain something, but because I already have it. It's a little bit like like winning the lottery. And I don't know this is the greatest illustration, but it's like like winning the lottery and the government doesn't take any taxes or anything out. You get the full, you know, what there's been a couple of them over a billion dollars, I think, you know, whatever it is. And you get that and you have complete access to use that resource to, to, to ha- have anything you want. The difference for us, it's not about getting selfish things. It's about me now committing my life to Jesus and living out the life that Christ has placed in me through the gift of eternal life that I have. I I think sometimes we get confused that we think eternal life is just I'm going to heaven one day. No, eternal life doesn't begin in heaven. It begins now. It begins the moment that I got saved. My life in Christ began. I became a new creature Old things were passed away. All things are becoming new. I, I was transformed and changed. I have that positionally. It's all there. But every single day of my life, I'm, I'm 60 years old now. I was 18 when, when I entered in that relationship. So for the last, you know, 42 years, I'm learning more and more about that. And I'm learning to live out that righteousness and tap into that, that wealth of righteousness that's been given to me through the power of the, uh, through the, through Jesus and even through the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. You know, I I, I want you to define righteousness because I think a lot of people really have a hard time wrapping their heads around or hands around what it even means. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the word righteous means to be right with God. Is that is that the case? Like, what's what is your when you say righteousness? How do you define it? So when I when I say righteousness, I'll back up because I think most of us understand sin more than anything. So. Sin, the word sin means to miss the mark or to fall short. Um, or uh, even a, a, one of the words that the Bible uses for sin is the word transgression. And the word transgression means to step outside of the lines. And so the easiest way to illustrate that is like if you're playing a basketball game, there are rules that you have that you, that you have to abide by. And there is, there's a court. And so inside of that court, you abide by those rules and you put a ball in a basket. And as long as you're abiding by the rules, then you, then you put the ball in the basket, then you score points. But as soon as you step outside the rules and maybe the easiest way to illustrate it, as soon as you step out of bounds, you could, you could run to the very top bleacher and shoot the ball in the basket and hit nothing but net every time. And it doesn't count because you have transgressed the court. You've stepped outside the line. So what sin is, is when I transgress specifically the law of God, who establishes the boundaries what God does. Well, what is righteousness? Righteousness is living perfectly inside of those boundaries. The, now, the problem is, is that I've already stepped outside the boundaries. I've already violated the law. And the penalty of violating the law, the scripture says, again, it's, this is God's word, not mine, is separation from God. So how do I get how do I get reestablished and no longer separated? That's by receiving righteousness. And if you want to really define righteousness, maybe the best way to define it is to define it with the person of Jesus. G- the Bible says that Jesus came to this earth as God took upon the form of human flesh. He was tempted in every way that we're tempted. And the idea there is, is maybe the, the, the greatest example is right after he as he enters in his public ministry, Matthew chapter four, the devil takes and he tempts him in the wilderness. And that's a a, a kind of a snapshot of the fact that he went through everything we went through and yet without sin. 
And that, and the reason why Jesus was that was without sin is because he's God and God can't sin. So in some sense, righteousness is living perfectly just as Jesus did. So what I have, I have positional righteousness. The Bible says he hath made him to be sin for us. That's Jesus who knew no sin. That's righteousness that we might be made righteous in him. In other words, what God did was, is that Jesus Christ came and became sin for me so that I might be made righteous in him. And it's a beautiful picture because when I, when I by faith receive Christ, he removes my sin as far as the east is from the west, but he just didn't take my sin away. He gives me his righteousness. The Bible teaches that I am placed into Jesus. I'm accepted in the beloved, which means that when God sees me, he sees Jesus and he sees his righteousness. That's positional righteousness. Now what I'm trying to do is to live out that practical righteousness. Maybe it's another simple word is holiness or the idea of I'm living according to God's path all the time. Um, and, and it's important to distinguish that you have positional righteousness, positional holiness, and you're learning to live out this practical righteousness every day. And one day the Bible teaches that, that our old body will be fashioned, be made like unto his glorious body, Philippians chapter three, so that, so that sin will sin no longer has sin no longer has authority over me. That's what the resurrection of Jesus did. But I still deal with the effects of sin. But one day I shall be totally delivered from sin in its presence. Paul described it like this: the corruptible body puts on incorruption, the mortal body puts on immortality. And the same, the same comes to pass. Oh. Oh, death, where is thy sting? And, and the truth is that death is swallowed up in victory, and so is sin. That's found in 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, well, I want to, I wanna, one of the biggest, um, the non-believers, the, the atheists and agnostics that listen to our show because they are trying to figure out this whole faith thing, I think like, yeah. like most of us, is, is ultimately the, like they feel like there's contradictions in the Bible. So, yeah. so you you brought one up, and and I think I, I think you being the theologist that you are, and and understanding the the Word of God and uh, so well, I'm I'm excited to pick your brain on some of those contradictions because maybe okay. you shed some light on some of those. Um, so let's let's talk about one you that you were just talking about how um, sin separates us from God, right? right? So I think it's Romans, and I'm going off memory, so I'm sorry if I no problem. <laughs> I don't have the scripture down quite like you do. Uh, My you wife know, calls it the angry. I'm working on it, but it's going to be a few more years. Give me a few more awesome. years. But, but Romans 9, I think it, it talks about how nothing can separate us, God, like not angel, not um, somewhere in Romans 9. Am I, am I crazy or is that in there? Yeah, no, no, you're right. You're right on Romans 8, actually. Yeah, yeah. Romans 8, okay, okay. Yeah, I, was, I was one time. chapter away. Yeah. Okay, but so so there would be, okay, so if sin separates us from God, then how is it possible that nothing, not even angels nor demons, whatever, can separate us from God? So that would be one of those. And then let's find more of those like uh, things that uh, non-believers might view as a contradiction that we can explore together. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So you have to understand the context of, of the passage right there. So the book of Romans is a great book. And I'll give you a kind of brief scenario. The first three chapters describe man in his sinful condition. And, and the Bible says um, that basically we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, there's none righteous. No, not one. Um, and so Romans three describes us in our sinful state and that we're, that we're separated from God. Matter of fact, it is Romans is Romans one, the first three chapters is Romans one kind of kicks in. The Bible says that God through creation manifest himself to people as God is eternal power in Godhead. And when they know him as God, they glorify him not as God and they become vain in their imagine, imagination. Their foolish heart is darkened. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the picture right off the bat of where sin will take you. Uh, but it, it, the scripture teaches, not just in Romans 1 through 3, that sin separates us. In other words, the relationship is, is, is no longer there. And in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, chapter 3, where Adam and Eve first fell into sin, God said, the day that you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, you will die. Well, what did he mean by that? They did not, they did not die physically. They began the process of death physically, but they died spiritually. 
the word death means separation. So when I die, when I die physically as a Christian, I believe that my body and my soul are separated from one another. And the Bible uses death as a description of my spiritual death. I am dead in my sins, which means I'm separated from God. Then you come into Romans chapter, the end of chapter three and chapter four, five, chapter four and three, into chapter three through chapter five, you have really the, the provision that Jesus made in order to provide forgiveness. Romans 5, 1, kind of the culmination. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, that Paul will describe later on in the, in the book of Colossians, I think it's chapter one, that we are, we're enemies of God. And that when salvation comes, we're reconciled. In other words, we're no longer an enemy. We now become, we're described as a child of God. We're child, described as a friend of God, we're tr- son of God. So there's a lot of different descriptions a- about that. So what justification does, he brings, brings me back to peace with God so that I'm no longer separated. So at the moment that my sins are forgiven, that, that gap, that separation, that spiritual death is replaced with life. And I'm now alive. Now, then you come on in chapter Romans chapter six and, and Romans five has just said, you know, boy, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so the question is asked, well, then should I sin more so that grace can do more? It's a, it's an honest question. It's a good question. And Paul said, no, no, that's not, that's not the goal. The, the, the goal of grace is to transform your life. Paul will then go on into chapter seven and kind of answer another question. And he talks, he talks, uh, he talks about doing things. He said, there's certain things that I know that I shouldn't be doing. Yeah. I keep doing those things. And he's talking as a believer here. And then he said, I know there's some things that I should be doing that I'm not doing. And he concludes the end of chapter seven with "Oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death. And he says, I thank God that with the flesh, I serve the law of sin, but through the spirit, through Christ, I serve the law of Christ. And then Romans chapter eight begins with this statement. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. In other words, what Paul is leading up through these first three chapters in chapters one through three were condemned in chapters three through five, Jesus makes a way to remove the condemnation and for man to gain peace. Chapter six and seven. Hey, but what about sin still present in my life? Ch- end of chapter seven, chapter. Hey, listen, don't worry about that. Your sin is under the blood. There's no condemnation. One of the beautiful truths of Romans chapter eight in the Christian world, we, we often like to quote verse 28 when we go through a, a great tragedy. And that verse says, and we know that all things work together for good to them of God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And that's a, it's a good verse to use. A loved one dies, you're going through a trial in life. But what makes that true is that the next verse says, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, every person in Christ, God has already decided that I'm going to make you like Jesus. And it's in that context that you then come down to verse 30 and that whole passage on nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus is a promise that is spoken to believers. In essence, if we had time to flesh this out completely, when God created man, Adam and Eve put him in the garden, we're created in his image. And all of mankind is created in God's image. Then mankind fell into sin. And so we now have a, a sin, a sinful image. But at the moment of salvation, in essence, what God does is he restores to us that original created image or the idea that now we're he is conforming us to be like God and he's guaranteed that that's going to be true that's the power of grace that's the power of forgiveness that God promises through that that I will never separate you from my love because I have already guaranteed that life that I've given you you have forever which is rooted in the righteousness of Christ so so for the believer yes you're no longer separated but that is something you're given at the moment of faith in Christ and you're restored back to what God originally intended for us to, to have. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it's like, so when you're sinning, you're severing the relationship, but you can turn back to God and, and truly ask for his forgiveness and, and then he'll bring you, then you, you re-receive him again, it sounds like. Yeah, so, so what happens is it's not, it's not so much re-receiving him, but he gives us the life that he intended for us to originally have is, is what it comes down to. So he uh, certainly it wasn't God's will for Adam and Eve to fall into sin and for the human race to be sinful. But because God is a God of love and he wanted us to love him, he gave us a free will. There's a lot of debate about that, even to the idea of free will. But there, you can't really have love without free will because love is a choice. It's an act of the will. If, if, if God just made us to be righteous without choosing that, relationship without repenting of sin, then it really wouldn't be love. It, we'd be robots and we really wouldn't be, we really wouldn't be in his image. And so um, what God does is he gives us that ability. And I, I, some of these things I can't even totally explain and comprehend that, but, but I know it to be true because the scripture teaches it that I have the opportunity now to be restored, to be the, a, a good biblical word is to be reconciled. Um, we understand that when two friends or maybe a, Maybe the best way is a husband and wife enter into a covenant relationship with one another in marriage, and then they get, let's say they go all the way and get divorced, and, and they break that covenant. And ideally, the perfect scenario would be for that covenant relationship to be reconciled, for it to be restored. And that, that takes both people doing the right thing. Uh, and, and, and what happens when we come back to, when we come to faith in Christ, we're reconciled. God has already done his part in sending his son, Jesus. And when I come and I confess my sin and repent, receive him, then God, and I don't reconcile myself. God reconciles the relationship through Jesus. So it's restored to what God originally intended for it to be. Okay. Gotcha. That's awesome. So let, let's explore some of the other uh, verses that people seem to struggle with or have a hard okay. time understanding. Um, what would what are some of those that you constantly hear of that bother you, or the bother you know, people that you find yourself explaining? Well, I, I, one of the things, and I would say this, I'll talk about it in a general sense. Often there's a there's discussion about Old Testament law and some of the guidelines in Old Testament law. I, I'll never forget. Um, I was in a, a skeptics week in, um, in Norway, in one of the cities there. And what happens is there's a group of Christians and they do this all over the country. They go into the, uh, the university campuses and they have what's called an apologetic style week in which they make a case for Christianity. And they do, they have an, an event at almost all of these called guerrilla Christians. So they allow people to ask all the questions they want. And a lot of times those questions, I think what people do because they, it's not because of a deep knowledge of the Bible, but you can Google anytime you want to, you know, um, supposed contradictions in the Bible. If you do that, I would encourage you to then Google the answers to the contradictions, see both sides of the fence. And um, this particular night, one one person stood up and said, kind of, kind of um, quoted an Old Testament law that if two men were fighting and, um, and the wife of one man came and grabbed her husband's opponent by his private parts. She has to have her arm cut off. Why does the Bible say that? Well, interestingly enough, I, I've read the Bible through many times, and this has been several years ago, and I've read it through several times before then, but I, I never recalled seeing that except a couple of months before I was reading through the Old Testament. Again, I saw that, and it just kind of intrigued me. And so... Part of the problem there is you're kind of emphasizing on you know, something that is very small, very, in some ways, insignificant, not necessarily insignificant to the woman that might have her hand cut off. But you have to distinguish to understand Old Testament law. You have to distinguish between civil law, moral law, and ceremonial law. There were some civil laws in the Old Testament they lived by that we don't live by in this day and time, nor does God expect us to do. But the moral laws are as relevant today as, all, as always. And then there's some ceremonial things like the sacrifices and things like that. The, the easy answer to that is that Christ has, has, has fulfilled those things and he's delivered us from all. The, the, the biggest answer and the, 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 the greatest answer to that is we've been delivered from the condemnation of the law and from being underneath the law. It doesn't mean that we're not, that we're not obligated to live 
by a moral standard, uh, but I, the what happens in Christ is, it's not only do I sense that obligation to live by a moral standard, but I want to live by that that moral standard because it's God which worketh in me both the will and the do of his good pleasure. That's what the book of Philippians says. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. And so a lot of people misunderstand that, you know, how can I be good enough to do all these things? Well, you may not understand that because you've not received the work of, of God through the presence of the Holy spirit in your life through the transforming, transforming power of salvation. God's delivered me from the law. In one sense, Galatian teaches that I now have the liberty in Christ so that I can fulfill the law. And the law is fulfilled in this, that I love God with all my heart and I love my fellow man as myself. And so a lot of those types of things, you have to kind of understand the particular, again, I go back to context and some of those things as well. Um, I think there's great discussion about creation and um, and what seems to be, uh, even within Christian circles, is creation literal or not literal? Yeah, um, is the Bible to be taken literally, especially on the creation side? This yeah. Is, I'm excited you were going to go there because I was going to yeah, go yeah. next. So I believe the answer to that question is yes. Um, uh, it is For several reasons. Number one, as you, as you look through all of creation, uh, when you look through all of the Bible, the Bible constantly repeats that God created the earth in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. Which I'm not a scientist; don't claim to be a scientist, but the the world works in week time frames, just as God set it up to be. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna talk broadly a little bit, and then I'm, I'm kind of honing on creation. God is revealing Himself to man in three different ways. Number one, he reveals himself through the scripture, through the revealed word of God. He reveals himself through the person of Jesus Christ, the living word of God, John 1 says. But the the beginning way that God revealed himself to mankind was through creation. If, If you believe there's a God, and I do, I also believe there's a devil, and I do. And the two are, the devil is an enemy of God. He's not a friend of God. And the devil's goal is to keep people away from God. So if I'm if I'm God's enemy and I'm the devil and I want to I want to cause people to not believe in God, then I want to attack that belief at the three foundational ways that God reveals Himself to man. So we see plenty of attacks on the Scripture. We see plenty of ta- attacks on the credibility of Jesus, but we also see attacks on the creation. What I do understand about the scientific proposals, theories about creation, none of them can actually be proven to be dogmatically true. They're all still theories. And while certainly I understand from a scientifically st- scientific standpoint, I may have very diff- I have an impossible task of, of proving that six day creation. But when I read the Bible, there's a number of different things that, that I come to. The, the literal translation makes the most sense to me of all, not only in, in reading Genesis chapter one, but as I studied out Genesis chapter one, um, the, 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 the way that it's written, I don't think it's poetic language. I believe it's literal language. It's easy to see. Again, the rest of the scripture supports that. Then when you, when you look at the other thing, I think you have to think about when it comes to creation is that creation, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, and they were, we, we endured the curse and we began to die. Physically, things begin to change. The God also cursed the earth. So in some sense, while we still live on the earth that he created, the earth is different than when he created it. Certainly, he created it with maturity. There's no question about that, uh, you know, because those trees had fruit on them. From, they weren't saplings in the ground. Um, Adam and Eve were capable of, of, of multiplying. I think all the other animals were capable of multiplying. You didn't have puppies and kittens and, you know, little, little lions. You had, you had, you had big animals. They were mature animals and the rest of creation was as well. But as soon as mankind sinned, and I don't think it was very long after creation, all the world began to, to, to suffer the consequence of sin. I'll say one other thing about that in Romans chapter eight, the Bible talks about, 
that even creation groans and travail. In other words, it struggles waiting for its redemption. Um, one of the beauties of the Christian life is, is and I'm 60 and, and I've had a, I've had some problem with my right eye in the past a couple of months, uh, retina detached and then a cataract. Oh, wow. So I had a couple of surgeries and, you know, basically the, what the doctor says is, is that's just old age. <laughs> it's just getting old. And, uh, it's, and the cause of the retina detaching, the cause of the cataract is all old age. And somebody said, you know, uh, getting old is not for the faint of heart. And, and I'm beginning to understand that right now than before. And it seems like, and I've heard people say this, it seems like every five year increment, things get a little harder. <laughs> they, get, they get a little, they get a little tougher on the body. And as the body ages, it makes sense to me as the earth is getting older and older, it's aging and it's getting harder and harder. So again, I can't scientifically prove that, but I do know biblically speaking that the earth is under a curse and it is the earth in essence, you might say is dying and that, that one day God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So I think when you harmonize all that the scripture has to say, you get some answers and some understanding, some things, even you know, how, how do you describe the age of the earth? Well, can you truly, can you truly um, measure the age? I, 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 again, I don't know. Um, you know, it's interesting that my, my father, so my father was a, uh, actually a scientist. He was a, an astronomer and he actually was an astronomy professor at a college and also a non-believer, but he is interesting. He shared a lot of things with me as a kid. Like he used to make us memorize like constellations yeah. and stuff, but I learned a lot of stuff from him as a kid that, that is interestingly applies to the Bible. And if he was still with us today, I would love to share some of the things I've learned, but, uh, you know, like one of the things that's interesting, my dad shared with me when I was a kid was that. You know, we are at a very unique spot in the uh, galaxy. We're we're at a, we're at a, like a very unique place in our galaxy where we are able to see um, now with the latest and greatest telescope technology. Like we can actually see almost all of creation. But if we were strategically placed anywhere else in the galaxy, we would be blinded by like we wouldn't be able to see outside of the galaxy because of yeah. uh, the the location. So we're in an interesting spot where like God kind of allows us to see everything, and and I think He wants us to. Um, there's other things too, where, you know, scientifically it's like, we're only, uh, you know, the wheels that God set in motion. It's like all these things had to occur. And there's like this finite window of like 50,000 years where, uh, that supposedly that, that life can exist on the planet earth. So we just happen to be like in this uh, stage and yet, you know, there's so far the only life found in the universe um, which is kind of interesting too. In this giant universe, like it was all created just so we could exist, and that's right. kind of interesting too. So um, no, I think I think you know science. The, the, it's like almost like the more they learn, it, it's, it's almost like to me they're proving more and more that God does exist. And that's yeah, not- I, I've heard some things lately too. And again, I'm that's not kind of my area of expertise, nor I, I'm not even an amateur in that area. Others can speak to that far better than I can. But I've heard some things recently, even more and more that. That, that scientists are beginning to understand that some of these things that have held, they've held to just cannot be validated. And uh, even the galaxies, like something to do with the speed of light and coming and going, mm-hmm. it's actually, it actually proves the opposite of what they thought it originally proved. And again, I, the, I, I hear that in passing. So I, don't take me as the expert on that. No. I, I think probably the most, to me, one of the most compelling things about creation is the, intelligence of our design there's just there's just no question to me that the way this earth functions like you just what you just said i've never heard anybody tell me that but it makes perfect sense to me because god didn't create god created this universe for man to enjoy um and for us to 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 live in and to live in relationship with him So it makes perfect sense to me what you just said, that God would put us at a spot in the galaxy that would allow us to see the whole of this creation. makes perfect sense. What about, okay, so I want to touch on a few other verses that I think a lot of people might struggle with. One of them is like Jesus said, I think in John, uh, you tell me which, which chapter, but we will greater works than these you shall do. And so how is it possible that man, that we will do greater works than Jesus? I mean, he was, healing people and right, bringing them back and all sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. I, I think the I think the emphasis there for Jesus was the spreading of the message of the gospel. Um, we as mankind have a tendency to get, we get impressed with the dramatic. 
Um, I've been in, I've been in, and I can't mention the name of this country. It's a, it's a country in another part of the world that's under a different type of control where being a Christian is not an accepted thing. But I, I've seen, I've seen a lady that came to the, a particular home as a leper and, and, and Christians came and they prayed with her three times a day. They're, 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 what they do is they pray and read the Bible three times a day. This lady eventually becomes to be a believer in Jesus. And because of the kind of the, the, um, the society that she lived in, being a leper in the community, she was kicked out of her community. And it, and it made sense because they don't have the, they don't have the medicine to take care of her. So she comes to this home. She finds out about this place as a, as a prayer house. And she comes, they pray. She becomes a believer. And the leprosy is gone. I, I, I'll never forget seeing her. I, I can still see her in my mind's eyes. But the, the beauty of the miracle there is not, is not the, the, the elimination of the leprosy, but the fact that her heart has been transformed. And now she's a believer and she's walking with Jesus. The, the story doesn't end there. She goes back to her, her village where she lives and she now is hosting worship in her home and sharing the gospel with this village. And they go back and they see the leprosy gone. Well, what happened? Now she gets to do the greatest work of all. And the greatest work of all is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe what Jesus was emphasizing there is because it's one thing that physical life that someone could come and they could lay their hands on my eyes, maybe and heal me inside perfect sight again. But one day I'm going to die. My, my body's going to cease to exist. So the greatest miracle is never a physical healing. The greatest miracle that any human being can ever experience is the spiritual healing. You might say that comes through the message of the gospel and through the forgiveness of sin in Jesus. So what Jesus is emphasizing there is you're going to take this gospel. Matter of fact, his final command was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I mean, right, let right. me just say the great, the great commission, right? Yeah. The great commission. Yeah. 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 I want to I want to bring something up in the Great Commission. I was in my uh, I'm part of a men's Bible study, and we kind of go over which verses are going to be, which gospel is going to be read in the upcoming uh, Mass this coming weekend, and then uh, and and we just did the Great Commission last week, and there was something in there that caught my attention, and I was like, I got to talk to someone about this on my show. You're the guy. Uh, All right, so but, good. Uh, well, but if you want to finish, if you want to finish what you're going to say, well, I just wanted to quantify, especially for those that maybe not be believers. You hear the word gospel. What is the gospel? First Corinthians 15 describes it as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and basically, all three of those things are significant. Jesus died by crucifixion, um, as the Old Testament really prophesied. Um, mm-hmm. He was buried three days, as he said he would be, in the, in, the, in the earth for three days. And at the end of three days, he would rise again from the grave. And he did that in victory over sin and the power of sin and over death. And so when we, when we use the word gospel, that's it. It's not, a, it's not baptism. It's not church membership. It's not doing a bunch of good things. The gospel is what Jesus has done, which you said earlier in the show, what distinguishes Christianity from all other systems of belief is that in all, all other systems, I do something and God, I gain the God's favor. In Christianity, God's done something to give me his favor. And all I do is take it like a gift. I love it. Big that, difference. That's, that's the word what your dad said about faith, which is you, you're receiving Jesus. Yes, yes. Jesus. Okay, so awesome. That is beautiful, and that's a great way to put it. And um, for you non-believers out there, I hope you're starting to see that God's already forgiven you. He's already given you His grace. You were born with it. Jesus already died for you. So, c- circling over to the Great Commission. Okay, so this is something that freaked me out. So I read it. And I was like, man, that is really beautiful, and it makes perfect sense. We're going to go forth, and we're going to bring people to God across all continents. And then it says, at the end, it says, and then I will be with you until the end of the age. So, okay, so wait a minute. I thought when we died and go to heaven, we get to be with Jesus forever. So what does he mean we get to be with him until the end of the age? That sounds like, um, just a lot like why is that the last thing in the Great Commission? Yeah, so in Acts chapter 1, um, basically, part of the promise that Jesus left the disciples was that if I go away, I will send another comforter to you. And so part of what we have, what we understand is, is that we enjoy the presence of God in creation. We enjoy the presence of God. I, I, you know, God, God is everywhere. The Bible teaches that the the theological word is omnipresent, 
But for the believer, the Bible teaches in Colossians that we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. And specifically what happens at the moment of salvation in Acts chapter one, Jesus told the disciples to wait in their upper room, 120 of them, and pray until the Holy Spirit comes. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and he indwells the life of the believer. And this is, this is a little bit, it's different than what's been happening. Um, in days gone by, the spirit would come upon people in the Old Testament, but he never, he didn't permanently live inside of every believer. And there certainly were believers in the Old Testament. But we're taught now, Paul says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the dwelling place of God on earth, he doesn't dwell in temple made with hands like in the Old Testament. He now dwells in our hearts. And so a part of what Jesus means when he, through the Holy means, Spirit, yeah, the Holy Spirit. Part of what he talks about is, is I have the presence of God. And, and when I think of God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, I, I believe the Bible teaches they're all three equal. They're, while they, there's different persons, they're, they, and they have different works that they do, especially in the work of salvation, they are all equal in their deity and their power. They all share, they're all eternal, they're all holy, they're all immutable or unchanging, they're all omnipotent, which means all powerful. They're all omniscient, all knowing. They're all omnipresent, which means, you know, everywhere at one time. And so you have that in the person of the spirit of God, but also what Jesus is referring to as you study scripture, at least this is what you can kind of think about is, is that, is that one day Jesus is going to come again. And, um, and I believe that scripture teaches Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to come again and he's going to sit literally on the throne of David in Jerusalem. One of the things that just convinces me more and more every day that the Bible is true. And I'm not, I'm, I don't say this to, to condone any actions, please. I hope your, your listeners will, will understand this, but the nation of Israel is a very, very unique nation for sure. Um, but the, the very existence of the nation of Israel is a living testimony to God in his existence and everything he says he's going to, to do. When God, when David was put on the throne of Israel, God said that your seed will always sit on that throne. And one day, I believe Jesus will literally come to the earth and sit on the throne of David in fulfillment of prophecy in the city of Jerusalem. Um, and, and then there'll be the thousand year reign of Christ and he will be with us through all ages. And, and, and I think when you think of ages, not just time on the earth, but also throughout all eternity, so that I am never separated, come back to Romans chapter 8, from God, his love, or his presence as a believer. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a broad answer um, to oh, a question. So, so when he says, I'll be with you until the end of an age, he's referring to the Holy Spirit, and the end of that age is when he returns and, and yeah. now he's with us, but in a different way. Instead of the yeah. Okay. yeah. And I think you can also understand the teaching of Jesus is that for the believer, that, that, that our eternal existence will be in the presence of God. We enjoy that presence even now, but we'll enjoy it in a way that, that Paul describes our faith becoming sight so that we will be seen as we're seen when we're in the presence of Lord for, forever and ever. Okay. All right. Well, this is awesome. What a great conversation, uh, Jim. I'm excited about where this is going. Um, I want to hit you with a couple more uh, scripture. That was a really good one that I, I was uh, glad that you helped unpack. I can't wait to share that with the guys in my uh, men's Bible study group. They're going to love that. So the uh, I want to speak to one. This is an interesting one uh, that I, and I, I want to share some insights on too. But four generations, there, what scripture? There's a scripture that talks about four generations will uh, uh will pay for our sins yeah the sin is is visited to the third and fourth generation I, um there's, what, what, yeah, there's so an old not, testament yeah we're, we're, right we're, we're supposed to have like this uh you know this is coming from you know our, our atheistic friends who talk who challenge the the scripture right and right. i think that's one of the ways they challenge it is like well god's supposed to be if he's supposed to be so loving then why is he so wrathful and and why is he so vindictive and but I, you know, so I, and I'm like, well, look, sins, that's something we do, right? And that, that's right. not something God wants us to do. So, but, but we pay for our sins. So anyways, but, but why do, why should our great, great, great grandkids and our great, 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 great grandkids. <laughs> so tell me about that. What's your. Well, uh, I think, I think what, what the scripture is emphasizing there is the idea of sowing and reaping. 
um, what what we as human beings often try to want to do we want we want to we want to we want to do one thing hoping for a totally opposite result. It's like saying, I want to sow corn. I'm going to put corn seeds in the ground, hoping I'll get an apple tree. And the reality is, is that the sins of the father kind of pass down to the, to the, to the next generation. I, I like to think about that as generational bondage, but here's the power of the gospel. Generational bondage, why that happens, and I think you can see it happen. I think through the power of the grace of Jesus Christ, that generational bondage can be broken. One of the things that you will see, especially go to the Old Testament, and you, you follow the course of the nation of Israel and their sinful their sinfulness. Quite often, on more than one occasion, God said, God told Moses, I, I'm just going to wipe everybody out and start all over again. And Moses stepped in on behalf of the nation of Israel. He interceded, we would say, on their behalf, and God changed his mind. Nineveh is another great example. When uh, the, story, the story of Jonah, you know, go, go tell Nineveh that I'm going to, and I'm going to destroy you. And Jonah, Jonah knew that God was merciful. And what we know is that Jonah really wanted to see Nineveh destroyed, but God wouldn't let him get away with doing it. So he goes and they proclaim a fast and God is merciful and restores. So while, while there is a principle that the Bible is, is, is telling us about, and we ought to, we ought to be cautious about I, as a father, I want my kids to be better than me. But when I understand that the things that I do as a father will affect my children, then it'll stir me to say, I don't, I don't want to pass that down. I'd rather pass down good things, not bad things to them. And the best way, if that happens, if you're the child, the Bible says even a child is known by his doings. And all of us give an account for our own life while we see the sins of our father, and it may be a struggle, through the power of God's grace and the power of God's mercy, we can overcome that. So, uh, I think what's being what I would say is is God is God is teaching us a principle about sowing and reaping. What you sow, you reap, and if you're going to have victory over that, the best way to do that is through the power of grace and the intervening power of God coming in your life. Walk with Him, let Him transform you, and break that bondage in your life. And I've seen that happen plenty of times. I've seen some of those same things. Alcohol, for example, and alcoholism. Uh, I understand there's a lot of debate about that, but I, I but I think there's a lot of sinfulness in that, not just not just the weakness. And I understand the body gets addicted, et cetera. But that there's an example of that being passed down. And one of the reasons why I began to pursue a relationship with God is that is that I had seen alcohol as my family and, and I, I never drank. I, I still don't drink to this day. I think the most I had was maybe a sip of wine and maybe a couple of swigs of beer when I was a teenager. And I do. I did have whiskey and Seven Up one time, and that was the worst stuff I ever put in my mouth. <laughs> so that was never, never really a temptation to me. But one of the things that I feared was getting out into the world and that becoming a part of my life. And so it drove me to the Lord. Interesting thing. I don't, you know. But so I didn't want that to be bondage in my life. It could have been, and I've seen it happen in other family members. But I thank God not because of something I did, but because of what God has done. He's delivered me from that generational type bondage, you might say. Yeah, God is definitely a phenomenal, uh, I mean, the ultimate power to tune into when you need to replace a, a bad habit or anything. I mean, it's it's yeah. like, to me, it's like the cornerstone of why Alcoholics Anonymous even works is because like they teach you, instead of turning to the bottle, you turn to God. And yeah, it's, yeah. You know, like, and I've used God in so many ways in my life to do the same, you know, and the, the four generation thing is interesting because so like I, I was just, you know, Kelly family history, but my, my grandmother who was, you know, she built bullet this Memorial day yesterday. So I'm kind of good. I was thinking about her yesterday, fresh yeah. in my, but she built bullets in the bullet factory for world war two. And she lost her hearing because of it, but she was also really like hardcore critical with my dad and used to like, just, you know, you know and she was, I loved her to death, but, uh, she was super critical of my dad. Well, that led my dad to be coming a, a certain way. And he was super insecure. And he, even though he was a, a phenomenal, like little, literal genius when it came to like astronomy and all this, he couldn't hold down a job. And and I think a lot of that's from maybe the sins of my, his parents, yeah. which, you know, and then, then my dad, you know, he had several divorces. And then, so all I kept hearing from all the women that would divorce, my, including my mom and the other women that would divorce my father was, if he would only just hold down a job, then, you know, he would be a great husband. 
So that led now I'm a uh, well, as a result, I became a psycho workaholic, which obviously affected my kids. Like my son didn't get to see me a lot growing up because I was so hardcore and working all the time in the car business. So I think, you know, when you really think about that, like a lot of the problems you're dealing with are literally maybe three or four generations old. And I think that Jim, what you're saying is right. I think you can lean on God to, to break that cycle. Uh, but for you atheists and non-believers, like when you think about the things you're maybe, you know, I guess portraying a victim around, <laughs> and I'm not trying to say, you know, blaming other people is, is, is good here. But what I'm saying is like, this goes right back to the Bible. Like, so what of your plights might be the sins of your great, great grandfather that's just been passed down for four generations. And it's unbelievable when you really start to read the Bible and try to understand the the scripture, how so much it all applies to our lives today. That's what's so interesting about it to me. Yeah. And what to me, that's one of the miracles of it is the fact that like this book that has been written thousands of years ago is still all of it is still extremely relevant today if you take time to find the meanings. Um, one of the ones that, that I just recently heard about, which I want to get your take on, is uh, Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Don't cast your pearls at hogs. And yeah. I was like, what the heck does that even mean? So what's your, what? and then this is an interesting concept because this show, the spirit of the show is to bring people who maybe aren't believers closer to God by, by you know, talking out their challenges, fears, and concerns. Uh, uh, so what's the meaning of, of casting pearls at hogs? And, and am I guilty of doing that here? No, no, I, I, it's kind of an interesting thing, and I'm not sure I totally comprehend even that statement myself. And one of the things that that, that I think uh, the the joy of studying the scripture is that I'm constantly learning. But I think I think part of the idea is that sometimes sometimes you're going to give you're going to give there's good things to give to people and they don't want it, and they're just basically going to step all over it. And maybe in in some sense it's a warning to us as as believers as I share the gospel. Don't get discouraged when the people reject it along the way. And um, for ex- I'll give you another example, which makes a little more sense to me. <clears throat> the Bible in the Old Testament says, answer, I think it's in the book of Proverbs, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. And then it turns around and says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. And so in some sense, what does that mean? It sounds contradictory. Yeah, but I think what it means, yeah, it's 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 do this, but don't do this. But then you flip the coin, and so you know, do this, don't do that. And I think the teaching there is is pretty simple. You need to pray for wisdom to know when to answer a person and when not to answer a person. Sometimes an answer is going to do no good. It's going to take them deeper into their folly. And I think the idea there sometimes is, is what happens is when you're casting your pearls, that which is a value, that which is great help in front of the pigs, they're not ready to take it. And so you kind of got to know when they're not living a pig's life, so to say. You know, when are they out of the pig pen and maybe ready to hear what has to be said? Sometimes what you just have to do is to love the pig in in the midst of the pig pen and, and maybe not preach a big, long sermon to them along the way. Um I don't know if that's the best example. You've it. now stirred me. I'm going to have to get into that so I can give you a much better answer of what it means to not cast your pearls before the swine. I don't, I'm not sure I gave you a really good answer. I love that answer. No, I, I think it's great. It reminds you at one point, a friend of mine way back when uh, he had read a book called the five love languages. It's a phenomenal book on marriage. Yeah, Great book. Yeah. Right. So, okay. You're familiar. And he, and he said yeah. that book has completely changed my life for the better. Um, not as much as the Bible, but, for, but, it, but it's, it's up there pretty good. And in the, in the book books, list of books that have helped me, me grow as an individual and as a husband. Yeah. And, but, he, but I remember way back when uh, this friend of mine brings it up to me, he's like, man, you got to read this book. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, and I didn't. And then it's funny because like, I don't know, fast forward 10 years and my marriage was struggling and in shambles and, and, uh, and and then my wife and I are going to counseling and literally my counselor's like, here's a couple books I recommend you read. And the first time she asked me to five love languages, and I was like, Ooh, I'm reading this right now. I remember that book from yeah. the, that I didn't read 10 years ago that I should have. Um, so at the time, you know, it's, uh, no, it, it makes perfect sense. It's like, uh, it reminds me of that Matthew verse, um, let, you know, he who falls on the rock will be broken, but he who the, the, the stone falls on will be crushed to dust or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, what's the, what's yeah. The, what is the little, literal verse? I, I can't remember exactly where that one okay. is. But yeah, you, you have given a pretty good summary of what it says there, yeah. 
So it's like, uh, it's one of those things where sometimes, yeah, we have to go through some some sort of tribulation for us to all of a sudden open our arms to that. Yeah. I mean, I think the idea of that teaching is, is that when I cast myself on Jesus, who's the rock, it's going to break me. But I need to be broken in the sense that I need to learn what he needs to transform. But if I don't, and he comes on me, then he, it's going to, there's the judgment aspect of it. Like a squish. Yeah. If, if I give myself to him, it, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to be, the, the pain and the sin and the brokenness that's in my world is not going to be exposed, but it's exposed in a way that brings me towards healing. The other way is I just, I just take judgment. The holiness of God requires a payment for sin. And if I will receive the payment that he has already made, then I don't have to, I don't have to suffer that consequence. But if I reject it, then, okay, I choose to pay it myself. And um, I'd much rather, one of the things I've learned in life is it's a whole lot easier for me to learn from someone else's mistakes than to learn from my own. And you can do that. And so I would much rather learn that way. I would much rather have the life that Jesus gives to me and let him receive his payment for my sin than me have to pay for my own. All, I have to, all we have to do is receive it, you're saying. That's it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, all right. I want to uh, I want to finish our convo. Let's spend our last 10 minutes or so talking about something you mentioned earlier, which Israel is a phenomenal example of why God exists. Yeah. Because I think this is such an important topic with everything that's going on in our society right now. And, you know, the, the news at least makes it look like there's this giant movement against Israel. Um, and there definitely seems to be some serious traction in some of the universities around that. And, you know, it's it's interesting because, you know, Israel is like at the foundation of, of like so much in the Bible, right? And it's mm-hmm. been destroyed and, and rebuilt and banished and brought back and just over and over throughout history. And to me, I, I love what you said there, that Israel is like proof and a, a shining example of, of why God exists. So with everything going and, and, and what you said earlier too about satan's going to attack the things that you know the the, the cornerstones of, of faith one of that would it would make sense that that would also be israel right because um, if, if you can get israel you know torn down then that's you know that's a good, something the enemy would certainly want to do so with all that in mind like what do you think is the intent of all this anti-israel stuff that's going on what, what are what is satan trying to accomplish here i, I think it's um I think it's in fulfillment of prophecy, basically. And uh, I hold a, a, a view, again, when you read the book of Revelation, that there's going to literally be a, 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 a big battle one day, what we often refer to as the Battle of Armageddon. I've been to Israel. I've seen, I've seen the Valley of Megiddo, which Napoleon called the perfect battlefield. And when you look there, you see, and in some sense, maybe now, uh, you, we don't see it as much as then because but basically – on one side of the valley, there's a mountain. On the other side, there's a valley. And and so it's the perfect battlefield. And I think what Satan is doing is, as much as anything is, is that, that God has, has always said that Israel is my, they're my chosen people. Through the seed of Abraham, all nations of the earth would be blessed. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Galatians very clearly teaches through the seed of the Abraham, the seed in, in particular, that seed singular is Jesus Christ. But then there's also the promise that Jesus will one day come again and will establish his rule on the earth for a thousand years. And as I said earlier, he'll, he will rule from the, from Jerusalem. One of the interesting things when you go to Jerusalem is the, the people that are there, and I would say what's going on in Israel is, is as much a spiritual warfare as it is anything. I'm not a politician, don't want to be a politician. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of things that go on both sides that are not good, you know, for sure. I think any decent human being would understand it. It's sad when, when children die, when civilians die, what happened back in October, all of that is horrendous. Um, but there's, there's this spiritual warfare that's going on. And one of the interesting things, I'll never forget this, standing over on the Mount of Olives and looking across to the Temple Mount. And the eastern gate to the Temple Mount is there. When you stand there, there's a couple of things that you notice. Number one, you notice a graveyard. 
in front of the eastern gate. Number two, you notice the eastern gate has been blocked up. It's walled up. There are no doors there. It's basically big stones and boulders, and they've sealed it up. Because the promise that Jesus will one day come back, this same Jesus that you've so seen go up into glory will come again in like manner. The idea is he'll come down to the Mount of Olives, the same place that he ascended to heaven, and that he'll go and he'll establish his kingdom. And the, the belief is, if I understand correctly, is that a rabbi a teacher would not walk through a graveyard. <clears throat> so they put a graveyard in front of the gate. And then just in case he'll do it, they've walled the gate up. How can he get through a, a walled gate? Of course, we know that Jesus Christ is no gate can hold him back. And he's the source of life. He overcomes death. So if, if the graveyard is in the way, he can take care of that. And that's just one little thing there that would, would show you that there is a, whether there's a belief in Jesus or not, there is an understanding of what he said he was going to do. And they're trying to stop him from doing what he said he was going to do. My, my biblical opinion on that is what's going on there centers around a lot of these biblical prophecies and things like that that are going on. I used to wonder, you know, I believe that one day uh, the scripture teaches there's going to be a one world leader. I believe that there's going to one day be the manifestation of an antichrist that will come and, and mesmerize the world. I used to think to myself, how in the world is that going to happen? And then one of the things that the pandemic did for me is that I saw the world come together around one thing that was really motivated by the fear of death. This this pandemic was a fearful thing. I, I heard you mention in our conversation, you know, some struggles. You, you apparently you you struggled near death with with um, with COVID, and I had good friends that died from COVID. But I can remember being in the Dominican Republic, and everybody had masks. I remember walking through Nairobi in in Africa in Kenya, and everybody had a mask. Um, they didn't have they didn't have access there. Their little blue surgical masks were almost brown because they couldn't get a fresh one every day. And a flight attendant on a major airline tell me if I was going to be in the Paris airport that I need for four hours, I needed four masks. So I needed to change my mask every hour. There's no way they could do that. Take all of those things aside. The whole world put a mask on. Yeah. How do you- it, it was almost like, okay, it is possible for one world ruler yeah. to No, I, man, no, it's yeah. so crazy. Yeah. So I, I think much of what's going on in Israel is centered around the biblical prophecy of that. Um, the unique nuances of it all, I don't know. Again, it's not an area of my expertise, but when I see the, the broad picture of the Bible, that's what I see going on. <clears throat> what I do know is, is that God has promised to preserve a seed in Israel, and he will do that. And yet, again, here's the devil, as we talked about earlier, the enemy of God wanting to destroy that, which God said, cannot be destroyed. So it makes sense that that would happen. He would come after it. And in some sense, in many ways, maybe the whole world is too broad a term, but much of the world is against Israel. And it is somewhat amazing to me, the condemnation that goes on one side that often is, is not as strong on the other side in some people's opinions. I could not agree more. It's really interesting to see like, the the one way hate and it just yeah. it, it's it, which is and it's so crazy too because it's just against the, everything we've as, at least as, as a america in general has been taught in even public schools for years up until recently you know i mean like literally the pledge of allegiance you know the whole yeah. thing like god is mentioned in there and yet nowadays it seems like a whole different animal and and yeah. I, I couldn't agree it's interesting to see how evil's working but you know to your point it's almost like they're proving God exists by the, what they're trying to accomplish. And they yeah. are they are just like literally making prophecy, what's been prophesied in the Bible, come true, which right. is kind of silly. You didn't think they would see that. I don't understand why they don't. Yeah, and that's in, in the biblical, even the explanation of that is the darkness. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And then the God of this world has blinded the minds of them, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So in, in essence, there is darkness over people's eyes to truth, and, and therein is the great deception. And, of course, one of the, 
one of the key caveats about any good lie is it contains an element of truth. And so most lies look, tr- look true and even maybe might be quote partially true, but a, but a half truth is a whole lie. Uh, I was once told, and I think that's, that's great, great wisdom. Yeah. The half truth is a whole lie. May I use that, uh, Jim? Yes, absolutely. It's not original with me. I promise. The half truth is a whole lie. That's great. Um, okay, so I would like to wrap up by having you do what you do best, and that is take us through some uh, scripture. And I think this this kind of I think this particular uh, scripture ties up everything we have talked about tonight. As okay. I'd like you to take us through Ephesians six uh, verses ten through twenty, the whole armor of God, because you talked about you know it's there's spiritual warfare going on, and this I think speaks directly to the spiritual warfare but it talks about the armor that we need to put on to essentially withstand the devil and the evil that's out in the world so would you take us through and kind of explain each piece of armor and how it applies to and you started off talking about righteousness right that's what made me think about ephesians yeah so take us your armor of god would you my friend uh, you're asking a Baptist preacher to to, to go through <laughs> ten verses of the scripture. Sorry, Catholic friends. That, we are that, with the Baptist that could take me a whole hour on a Sunday morning, but uh, but, I, right. but I might do that. So you, I think one of the ten, ten minutes, ten minute highlights, all the right? ten minute version. I think one of the most important things to understand about that is is that God provides us everything that we need in order to have victory in the spiritual warfare that we're in. But one of the things that that I would say right off the bat kind of in, is in an introduction to this whole passage of scripture is that we have to understand that we are in a spiritual battle as believers, that, that there is, there is a devil that's active and that we also have flesh and that, that while I'm, I have the righteousness of Christ, my, my sin nature is still present there. So that, that I, that I, that there is a battle between the old nature and the new nature and so how do I overcome that? Well, verse 10 talks about being strong in the Lord and the power of his might, which is an interesting verse because we know that God is strong, but he says, I'm able to be strong, not just in the Lord, but in the very power of his power. Again, I don't, I don't know how to totally explain that, but, but it, it just, it kind of emphasizes the power of the power that's to my uh, available to me. And, and I have that power through the armor of God. And when I, when he says put on the whole armor of God, I think this is something that we have to understand that that we have available to us every single day. And I, I basically not so much that I am that I'm going out and getting these pieces of armor, but I'm recognizing that I have them at my disposal. Peter says that we have all things in First Peter chapter one that pertain or chap, it might be Second Peter chapter one. We've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so when he comes down, uh, we put on the armor of God that we can stand against the wiles of the devil or the attacks. So this, this, this armor is a protection against Satan's attack on us. And, and again, you, you understand that we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, verse 12, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, that word darkness again, of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, there is a real spiritual battle and a spiritual warfare going on, by the way, not just for the believer, but also for the heart and the mind of the atheist and the agnostic. One of, one of the things that I hope your atheist and agnostic friends would at least hear from me, that according to the scripture, the God of this world seeks to keep you in darkness to the gospel. I would challenge you to read the Bible, open the scripture, let the light of the scripture permeate that darkness. And so what do we have? We take the whole armor of God to withstand in that day of evil. And having done all, we're able to stand. So what do we have? We have our loins girt about with truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. And I'm not a Roman soldier, but my understanding of this is kind of the way this is described is that each each piece kind of describes how a Roman soldier would, would put would put on uh, put on his armor, his garment to go out to battle. The foundation of that is truth, which brings us to the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The devil attacks it, but I read it and I believe it. And God has taken his word and he's transformed my life. I don't know that I can explain that to you scientifically, but I can tell you it's true. 42 years of it, I can tell you it's true. 
Um, There's a lot of believers out there that'll vouch for that same way, including myself. And, you know, I, we, and, and there, this is a whole other conversation, but like, you know, the, 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 I love what you said about the, the girdle, the belt, the girdle of truth, because, you know, it's like, you can take every translation that exists from the Bible and bring it and it, and it's all documented and it goes all the way back to the original scrolls that they've, they found yeah. and canonized. And, and there's no, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's a, it's a perfect book and it's the only book on the planet that you can do that with. Okay. Sorry. Anyway. Yeah. And, and part, part of under the kind of the, the, um, apologetics to the, that the Bible is true and it is God's word. It's just what you mentioned, the idea of the, the vast number of manuscripts that we have and the consistency when you put them all together. So that girdle is kind of the foundation. And then you put on the breastplate of righteousness, which is, is something that I have in the person of Jesus Christ. We've talked a lot about that, that I understand that I have, that I am, I understand my identity in Jesus, that I, who I am in Jesus is that I'm righteous. Often when you ask somebody who they are, who are you? They'll list, they'll list, well, I'm a father or I'm a husband, or they'll tell you what kind of work they do. Those are all roles that you have in life. That doesn't define who you are. That defines something, identifies something that you do. I'm identified by Jesus as righteous. And I, I must understand that to be true and receive it as true. And then I prepare my feet. You, you don't, they didn't go to battle without moving their feet. I prepare my feet. To, to, pre- to preach the gospel of peace. The only thing that brings man to total peace with God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Romans 5, 1 says that. So with truth as a foundation, I understand that I'm righteous, which then enables me to be ready to go and share this peace. How can I share with something you that I don't know myself? It, you know, I, what I've tried to share with you tonight is my, as my, as my friend, as my brother on this show and, and with the, with the others that are listening, this is how I have peace with God. This is the gospel. And then I take the shield of faith. In other words, faith is what protects me from the attack. It, it wards off when the devil shoots his darts at me or he makes his attacks upon me. How do I continue to please God? <clears throat> Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But through faith, I do please God. And I can quench, I can overcome, I have victory. And I take the helmet of salvation which again protects the head, how important that is. I think it's so important that we understand all that we have in salvation and redemption. This summer, we're going to be in Norway, and for a week, we're going to teach the doctrine of salvation. Soteriology is the theological word for it. We'll eventually put that online with the New Bible Institute that we're, we're starting our ministry. But it's so foundational to this wall. And then the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We come back to truth again. We come back to the person of the Holy Spirit who gives us that power. And I take God's word and I use the word of God to share with people. Uh, I don't forget the very first time I was in Skeptics Week, and I'll, I'll kind of wrap up with this because this kind of is the conclusion of the whole thing. When I, uh, verse 18 through 20 talks about prayer. But I was, I, was, I was given the task of talking about the reliability of the Bible. And I spoke about the Bible from a from a theological standpoint, I didn't go through all the manuscripts and all that stuff. I wanted to go to the heart of the spiritual matter of it. And I'll never forget the antagonism that came at the end of that. And, uh, and, it, and when you're in battle, the enemy's going to fight back. But there is no fighting against the truth of God's word. When you go from there, then we have a wonderful, wonderful tool to, to, to really, I, can, I think, appropriate this. And that's prayer, praying always with all prayer and supplication and persevering supplication for the saints. And he talks about that. And again, verse number 19, that I may, he says, pray for me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And again, the mystery of the gospel, that's not some mystery kind of like a, like a a sci-fi or a mystery novel or something like that. This word mystery means something that God has not revealed up until this point in time. And the mystery has now been revealed in the gospel, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, that we have his righteousness. We are now his dwelling place and God lives in us. And that we, not only as Paul was an ambassador, we're an ambassador to share with the world this wonderful truth. So what I do is I take this armor, I take truth and I take righteousness with my feet prepared to share the gospel. And then I take faith to protect against the attack. 
and the sword of the spirit, the word of God, the one weapon you might say that I have. How do I, how do I penetrate that darkness? I penetrate it through the power of the gospel. And then I pray that God will give me boldness to be faithful to do that. And therefore I can't accomplish that which God wants me to accomplish. And even when I fail along the way, that, that armor is still there so that I can get back up, put it on and be restored and ready to, to once again, carry out that battle and have victory and be useful in this world as an ambassador, as a representative for Jesus Christ. One of the great joys that I found out when I gave my heart to Jesus back in 1981 was that he made me his representative and far better than being a medical doctor, maybe discovering some great cure for, for leukemia and, and, I pray that that will continue to happen and we'll discover cures, but the greatest cure, because we won, it's appointed unto all men one day to die. And after this, the judgment, how can I help people be prepared to meet God on the judgment day? And that's through the gospel. Right. You're talking about it's a difference between temporary and eternity and the, the, yeah. carry the, the, the same weight. And you, you have to look at it through the eternity we had a guest a few uh, a few shows ago that talked about putting on God goggles, and I'm like, "What does that mean?" And she's like, "You know, that's focusing on everything's on an eternity. Every decision's an yeah. eternity basis, not the temporary life we have here." And there's so much peace in that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's like like the people that are truly that put on the whole armor of God truly are. Uh, they're just in, they're, they're whole and they're almost at peace. Uh, compared to other people, and I, and I, when I put on the whole armor, of God, when I when I make that choice, when I use those tools at my disposal, I that's when I'm at my best. Now you know it's funny. I'll, I'll wrap up uh, here uh, to say I, I was at, you know, I forget what it was, but I, it was a, like a meeting with my deacon a few years ago, and he had talked about how you know if you're going to do something awesome, like why not lift that up to God, you know, to to say, hey Jesus, I'm going to give, I'm going to do this for you, and and since then it's funny, like. I'll do something cool and I'll be like, oh man, I should have lifted that up for God. It's too late now. Anyway, I'm like, you know, I want to, should have done that before and whatever. But uh, this past, so like, like two, two weeks ago, I was at a, speaking at a leadership conference in Atlanta and on my Uber ride to the, the place where I was going to speak in, a, in about an hour, I, it hit me. I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to do this one for God. And, and I finally, for the yeah. first time in like years, I've been thinking about it for years, but always after the fact. So I said to myself, I'm going to lift this one up for God. And, you know, you know, looking at verse uh, 20 there, for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And uh, and I literally went and I so I, I walked out on the stage and I knelt down and, and God was like, pray, start off your speech with a prayer is what the Holy Spirit told me. And yeah, like, good. Oh, that's, that's bold. I was like, all right. Whatever you say, God, this one's for you. So I'm going to do. It. So literally, it's funny. Whenever I do, I, I pray publicly. I always have struggled to find the words, which is not normally my problem in life. Uh, but whenever I go to pray publicly, I kind of run into that. This was the first time that the the words just flowed through me. I felt like it was the most the the, the most impactful prayer that I've ever said. And I know it was like God telling me to do that for those people at that time. And and it was because I decided to. To declare it boldly and this show exists for the same purpose so thank yeah, you um, jim you're uh you're a blessing and, and thank you so much for being up on the show today um i am so grateful for you taking time out to uh be a part of the humble faith show thanks for having me sean i appreciate the time and uh great to spend some time with you tonight too oh man hearing your insights on the word were absolutely breathtaking i could i could uh ne- listening to you talk about scripture could never get old to me my friend well awesome. i appreciate you saying that i i love the word of god and i I'm so thankful for the grace of God and his work in my life. I, I have no regrets for, for, for giving my life to him and what he's done with me. And he's done far exceedingly abundantly of all like I, I could have ever thought he would do with my life. And I believe he'll do the same for you, humble faith listeners, if you'll just give him a chance and receive him, as our guest Jim said earlier. Um, thank you all, humble faith listeners, for tuning in. This has been another episode of Humble Faith, where normal people can express their fears, doubts, concerns, and questions about God. God bless you all, and have a great rest of your day. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in 
and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.